Loretta Houston. <laughs> Gosh. Gosh. <laughs> You're too funny. No, I'm serious right now. Cheers. 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 Boom. Let's, let's get this party started. Cheers to everyone watching. You probably wonder why we're doing tequila shots. We don't call it tequila shots. We call it truth zero. Sir. My truth, God. <laughs> truth serum, truth Woo! serum. This is a true. This is a podcast where we leave nothing, nothing hidden, and everything comes out. And the only way you do that to people is by creating truth serum, which is called. Is it tequila. that brown liquor though? Yeah. Brown liquor is a truth serum. Is that what it is? Yes, it is. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I mean, that is some good tequila. I mean, truth, <laughs> truth serum, truth serum. <laughs> Truth serum. Um, okay, let's see. I am really excited to have you, and you are a neighbor. You are like really close to here. Thank you for having me. We're in downtown LA. Yeah. So you live close. We're here in the studio. This is my studio here. We're going to make this podcast as often and as amazing for people to listen to this as possible. And you have so much to offer, so much experience, so much craziness that about this industry. You and I both have had some amazing conversations uh, about this industry, and I thought a lot of people out there would benefit from, from listening to this instead of just keeping it to ourselves. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's, I'm going to ask you some funny questions real quick because I want to kind of get started in a funny way. Here we go. And you have <laughs> no, you were not ready to any of these questions, so they're just going to have to come out of your mouth as I ask you. You're going to have to answer these very quickly. Mm. Very quickly. Mm. You should be fine. What is the first thing you do when you wake up? Look at my cell phone. Bam. What is your favorite chili flavor, chili for flavor, and what is your favorite chili you could eat raw? I didn't even know you can eat chili raw. I do. I eat chili raw every morning. That's the first thing I do when I wake up. <laughs> Black people's chili? <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, you. I do eat the chili all the time. I have no problems with the chili, but you. I'm curious what people's chili. The reason why I discuss chilies is because chili is the way I describe my lighting and my photography. It has a, like spiciness to it. We want to have it keep it spicy. Ah, okay. So the lighting that I tell people is this lighting has no spice. It has to have some chili on it. That's why chilies are important to me. Plus, I'm Mexican, so... Why don't you just add a little bit of the jalapeno in it, some peppers, like... That's the problem with jalapeno. You know, it condiments, have any spice. like It doesn't spices. have any spice. You know, you need something minimum serrano and up. Serrano, habanero, Carolina reaper. These are the kind of chilies we're talking about. Jalapeno is good for mostly flavor, but it doesn't have any kick. It doesn't kick your butt in. You know, it's just kind of like lame. Well, you can't tell me that when it's in my drink. If you went on vacation, what lens would you choose? You can only take one. 35 millimeter. Classic. I like that. I like that. Cheers to the 35 millimeter. Cheers. Boom. What, um, are you a night, are you a night owl or are you a morning person? I'm both. Interesting. What, would you prefer to have dinner with a landscape photographer or an astro photographer? <laughs> Astros like the stars and all that mm -hmm. or a landscape Person. Landscape, because I can make money from it. You don't think astro people? <laughs> just like, no. Nope. I mean, I really don't know, so I can't even answer that. But I could take the landscape and make it my own and start shooting real estate photography or wildlife photography. I can take it to another stint. Yeah, I think uh, landscape. Uh, I've done, I, I did have dinner with an astro photographer. Those guys are intense. Oh, I'm sure. They're intense. Like in the... In the nerd scale, it's high. Yeah, it's high. I've heard. Yeah, it's high. But I mean, I'm we're not all, there yet. We're all nerds a little bit. We all have a little nerdy. Maybe mm -hmm. you're not. You're, you're super cool. I'm definitely nerdy. <laughs> you're more nerdy, 150 <laughs> percent more than me. I, uh, this is some, these are just like hashtag facts. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> just hashtag facts. Okay. <laughs> I am a nerd. That's okay. Um, what is the best advice you have ever received in your photography career? Um, I think the best advice that I received was in order to be a great photographer, you need to shoot how to, you need to shoot indoor and outdoors to know both. Exactly. That is such a good advice because yes. people need, um, people get stuck in their own little bubble 
they, they say I'm, I'm I shoot natural light and they never go into the studio. Um, I get it. People don't have to go into the studio. They can stay outside forever, but it can be chilly outside. You see my reference, no pun intended. It can get chilly outside. <laughs> I need you to stop. <laughs> stop it, please. We um, also, I think that a lot of us start our careers in outdoor kind of photography. It's the easiest thing to manage. You have more, you feel like you have more control over things. Um, and that's a topic we can get into that requires its own like big discussion because that's a big one, but uh, we can discuss that later if we have time. But I think having having no limits to to yourself and to your work is the key to success, I think. I think if you don't have any so, challenge, exactly, you'll be bored. And I am a photographer that I need challenge. That's right. I need to challenge myself in order for me to be better. Right. We can't be, we cannot just be in our comfort zone forever. I think in the creative world, being comfortable is kind of like putting your feet on fire. No, it's you, you deathbed. Can, you can, it's your deathbed. Like you are never going to survive. Being comfortable, you won't survive. Um, exactly. The more you get out of your comfort zone, the more you will succeed. And you will surpass other people. You will have more clients. You will have more options. It's going to be great. So that's a good one. Um, what is your biggest pet peeve? What pisses you off? Like just like, mm. Now, are we talking like what, home or are we talking about personal? Are we speaking of photography? Like what? Let's say we're discussing personal. personal. Mm. What personally is disloyalty? Ooh, okay. All right. That is big for me. I am a very loyal person. Once I figure out you're not loyal to me, I keep it moving. Oh my God. <laughs> yes, I'm straight cutthroat. What? Is your pet peeve that you can think of on set? Disrespecting me. Ooh, hold on. I got to switch over to high five for that. <laughs> Don't disrespect. Do not disrespect. I mean, you are the boss of your crew. Yeah. And if your crew or anybody on set is disrespecting you, then any... Anyone else looking at you will absolutely not respect you anymore. So you got to lay the grounds down. Hmm. I just don't tolerate disrespect. And once I figure it out and I see it, I am known for the room. Everybody knows when Loretta brings somebody to the room, I'm having a real deep conversation with you because there's something I don't like. I did hear that about somebody that worked with you. Really? Yes. Yeah, like, yeah, somebody did say uh, once Loretta tells you she wants to have a little chat, that's pretty much the last time they you'll told be on you set. that. Oh yeah. my gosh, pretty much. <laughs> That's pretty no. much the last time you'll be on set. I'm much better. You know, I give yeah. you a few chances to correct it, but if I feel like you keep doing it over and over again, that means you're not learning. You're not learning who I am as a photographer and what I like and what I don't like. I think that it's so valuable that you're saying this to the podcast because people listening, they may think that's not a big deal. It's just a difference of opinion. But there is a difference between opinions and a difference between being disrespected on set. As a wedding photographer, when I used to be shoot weddings, I'm a fashion photographer now, but when I used to shoot weddings, I would get disrespected by a lot of the wedding coordinators. Mm. They, they, and, and, you know, I get it. They have a very stressful job and they cannot, you know, anything that can that throws them off their game can really disrupt the entire timeline and it can be it's on them but their approach many times was a disrespectful tone just to kind of get to it and that threw the entire energy that i had with my clients out the window so um what i do and this is another piece of advice that i will give to people if you're ever in a disrespectful position is to give people a slight convers a slight chat beforehand that if there's any kind of changes of opinion or disagreements or on set, that this being disrespectful is it's a no-go. That should even have to be a discussion. That no, should already be known. Right, but here we are. You are the boss, period. Yeah. The clients look at you. The crew looks at you. Your client's client looks at you. Once someone disrespects you, it becomes where they don't respect you anymore mm. to a certain extent. Mm. No one sh on set should question you except the client. Period. That's it. Hmm. I um, 
I agree that nobody, we, that conversation shouldn't happen, yet it's a real problem. I agree. You know, I agree. It's a real problem. It's just kind of like really too bad. But <laughs> um, you go to a bar. What is the drink that you order most of the time? What is your go-to drink? Straight up bourbon on rocks. Okay, I got to put this. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> Cheers. I don't know. The motor, you know, I'm getting older and the sugary drinks don't do it for me anymore. I like straight liquor to the point, you know, fluff just like my life. <laughs> so what about a classic uh, old fashioned? Would you take that? I definitely sh I drink that, too, as well. Old fashioned and bourbon. OK, but old fashioned has sugary. Mm, but depends on it. how you ask for it. OK, bam. <laughs> Fucking dropping bombs, people. <laughs> dropping bombs. <laughs> okay. I am a woman full of wisdom. Well, what is the weirdest thing you've ever eaten? Mm, pig ears. <laughs> <laughs> I went to someone's wedding right. in the Philippines and ate pig ears. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I got something worse than that, but I won't say that. Uh, everybody, would you like to hear what's the weirdest no, thing? No, you're not going to get it from me. <laughs> uh, um, I feel like they all want to know now. So, so give us a hint. <laughs> no. I'll tell you what the weirdest thing I've ever eaten. What? And just talking about it makes me sick. Um, guinea pig. You ate a guinea So I oh, watched no, no, a no, reality no. show yeah. and some well, someone said that people actually eat guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. And I was completely shocked about that. You know what I'm saying? Yes, so as you should be. Wow. Yeah. Let me tell you something. It was the most traumatizing thing I've ever had in my life. I went to Peru. I was in Cusco and we were about to hike Machu Picchu. Mm. So I went actually with Jerry Guionis and Melissa, his wife and my wife. We're all good friends. So we all went to Peru. We were hiking and we went to these restaurants before we went. We hiked a three day hike mm -hmm. and, you know, you're in Peru. So Machu Picchu is... Uh, it's full of guinea pigs in every single person's home. Wow. They they have a they have a home with twenty five guinea pigs all over Cusco, which is where you start the hike. Mm -hmm. Ooh, anyway, so I went to the restaurant and they told us that we were gonna have uh, that their specialty was guinea pig, and I had to have it because that's I mean Peru. I mean of course that's what you do. Mm. And um, when I ordered the guinea pig, I thought it would be like like hidden, like mm -hmm. chicken tenders are, you know, it's like chicken tenders don't look like the chicken, you know, it just looks like edible something. Mm -hmm. So no, oh no, no, no. This came, the whole guinea pig was just dipped in oil, like literally with a hair, the whole skin. The hair <laughs> and the skin. And the eyes, the whole thing was like in my plate and I had the plate and I saw the whole guinea pig in front of me and the whole hairy hair was on the thing and I was just like, Oh, hell no. <laughs> no. Like, what is this? Is this some sort of joke? Um, no. Anyway, of course, you can't say that because you don't want to offend them. Right. It's culture. It's culture. You don't want to offend. So I said, hmm, wow, look at that. <laughs> just, just like somebody, please just kill me. And I started eating the guinea pig and Jerry and Melissa were staring at me kind of like just to see my reaction. And my reaction was exactly what you would imagine it to be when I put the first body in my mouth. I didn't know how... If I should throw up to my left, should I throw up to my right? Should, should I dump it into it? Like, should I do the old like napkin uh -huh. thing? Like, I'm just taking something. Or is up it one of I'm, those projectile, you know, kind of? Is it a projectile throw up? Yeah, one of those like two feet. Out? I did that with goat's milk. Oh, that's disgusting. Yeah, but you do like goat milk cheese. Yeah, but, but as not, a kid, I used to know. drink goat milk in the Philippines and. That was such a bad experience because I just literally just threw it up all over the table. And ever since then, I have a love and hate with milk, period. So let's before we get into the actual program, you talk a lot about the Philippines. What's the deal with the Philippines and you? I am born and raised in the Philippines. My mother is Filipino. My father is black. And I've lived there for 15, first 15 years of my life. And Tagalog was my first language. So I didn't know any English. So, yeah, every time I went to school, they wanted to put me back a grade or two because I didn't know English. You know, it's funny. When you first meet you, Loretta, mm -hmm. you don't think Filipino. Like, you don't look Filipino. You don't act Filipino. I was just in the Philippines. They're the nicest people in the world. Yeah, they're always nurses. They always doctors. say, thank you, sir. Thank <laughs> you, sir. 
Salama Thank you, Spa. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I went to the hotels there and they were like, can I have, can I get a, uh, can I get something? And instead of them saying, instead of me saying thank you to them for bringing it to me, they would be like, thank you, sir. Yes. And I was like, can I just marry all of you, please? Yes. I just want to marry all of you. I love you all. Oh, my God. <laughs> how could you not marry a Filipino person? <laughs> but you were r- born and raised in the Philippines? Yes, I was. Do you speak Tagalog? I used to speak Tagalog. Now I just yeah. know I understand it more because I'm not around my cousins and family members here in the U.S. So I pretty much lost a lot of it. But when I go to the mall, you know, I hear some Filipinos talk about something in the mall and I literally join the conversation. So do you feel like your Tagalo or your your experience in the Philippines influenced your fashion photography work in any way or no? Um, I think it creates it makes me open to experimenting other cultures and bringing that into my photography i'm a very cultured person so yeah you can check out my stamps on my passport (laughs) i find that to be interesting how does being open help you decide i mean i know this is a hard question because you can't just answer it it's kind of instinctive but how does your openness cultural openness because you have experience in southeast asia how does that influence or if or if any the decisions you make in lighting Colors, composition. I think if you're stuck, yeah. this is just like this. If you ordered a salmon and you don't try anything else, so all you've known is salmon. You don't order shrimp. You don't order crab. What makes you grow more? What makes you more open? You're going to have a bland life, bland photography. So I think most people need to be at least cultured, travel, be around other people who are different from you. That's the only way you're going to open your eye toward making a difference in your photography. The value that we just you just provided right there is enough for people to just close this podcast down and be good with it. Don't do that. <laughs> we have more of this juicy stuff coming. But I cannot tell you how great that answer was. And I hope people take it to heart that never live in your neighborhood. It's like running a 10K with handcuffs and a ball and a chain in your ankle. Or eating chili without the spices. That's there just, we go. Well, everybody should be eating chili. To me, <laughs> it's sacrilegious not to. I don't understand any, anyone that doesn't. But for you listeners out there, everybody, thank you so much for listening to this incredible first podcast, first of many, is that what you just said was having more experiences in your life opens your brain up to things that you would never be privy to, you privy to. You would never decide or see things in a different way. You would basically just see it the way you you see it in your it's little very linear in your little cone in your little cone world. Yes. And then people wonder like, how does this person photograph so well in so many locations? And they don't ever think it's because of your experiences or with, background with exper- yeah with experiences your background where you come from. Mm-hmm. Like I con- I was born in Mexico City. Sure, that influences the way I see things. I've traveled the world. I've gone to Europe. I've gone to the Baltic states, which actually were, was crazy, like Lithuania, Finland, like all those, mm-hmm. um, Estonia. And the way they see the world was so different that it changed my photography forever. But it's not about me, it's about you, so we'll discuss that later. But that's, that's a really cool thing to say. But we also have to add that if you're not available to travel, maybe people, I've known a lot of people who don't have passports, but if nothing else, befriend someone that's different from you. Mm. Of different culture. That's a good point. You learn a lot. You could actually just be friends with a person yeah. from the Philippines. Exactly. Or from whatever country. Yeah. And and, and you can just learn. I from swear them. you're not gonna hate Lumpia. You're gonna love Lumpia. <laughs> uh what the heck is Lumpia? It's like a little egg roll that's um that we uh, actually eat in the Philippines and you can actually have it with meat and it's really skinny and people love it. That's the first thing that goes out when we have a family get together. Have you ever ate have you ever eaten um balut? With in, and, well, yes, and I before, have. And yes, I have. I tell the audience real quick that balut is um say it. <laughs> say it's it. A, it's an unborn it's an unborn uh little chicken It's still in the egg but it part of its shape is already forming. Yes. Okay. And people in the Philippines, this is like they're, this is like a, like it's a like eating snail. Yeah. For French. It's like a delicacy for them. 
I don't know. Um, I, I kind of feel like I should try it. My friend Arbany just did it. Oh, really? Yeah, Arbany. You know Arbany? Yeah, no. She, she's, she was Miss Universe in the Philippines mm-hmm. like in 20, anyway, just last year. She ate balut. She put it on Instagram. I wanted to like die. But then I was like, you know what? I need to open up my head to experiences. I got to try it. I got to try this balut. It so, actually really tastes good. Are you serious? Like, yes. What does it taste? Is it liquidy? Like it just comes out of your mouth? Like no, 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 no. It's not liquidy. It's like in between. Like if you actually put your egg on for eight minutes, you still have a little bit of runny, but not really. Okay. It's it's around that, but it's really really good. Okay. I mean, close your eyes if you're you know. Yeah, I will. I will close my eyes. <laughs> can you add hot sauce to that? Yes, you can. You can. Yes. It's not sacrilegious to put a little no, hot, no, hot no. sauce in your balloon. No, no. Okay. Um, what goals have you had that never came to fruition? What goals? We're talking about photography, right? Yeah, sure. What are some of the things you really wanted to do in this industry and they just never came true? I wanted to be the top 10 fashion photographer in the U.S. I wanted to basically have a six figure um, six figure campaigns i wanted to shoot vogue i wanted to shoot everything possible that had meaning for me and um i had to come to a certain point where if that happened that's great but it's also a good change for you to actually make a difference in the small things that you do what, if you're willing to share, did you do that made it so it never came to fruition? What would you do differently if you could start over to make those goals a reality se- second time around? I wouldn't, I wouldn't change anything. Because whatever I had going on was my destiny, period. And I've every, I did everything possible to be there, but it just sometimes the goals that we really want... Are not your goals. You mean they were not meant for you? They're not meant for you. Maybe you as a photographer was supposed to make a change within your community. Maybe it was for you to be an educator for other photographers. Sometimes we dream big, but sometimes we have a different path that we need to go on that we accidentally just kind of jumped into. And um, to me as a photographer, I see that change as an educator and someone who actually works. I do both and I enjoy both. And after the last couple of years of ever since I shot Sports Illustrated Swimsuit as the first black woman to shoot for the magazine, I made a lot of change. I made change to actually see that other black women can actually shoot the things that I shoot, that it cannot be all male driven industry that we do have a chance in this industry to make a difference, mm. whether it be small or big. Wow. That is an unexpected answer. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think I was going to go that far. <laughs> it was unexpected because I look back at my life and I think like I've achieved a lot in this photo industry, but I've had dreams that never came to fruition either. And I, I go to bed thinking like, stupid me, stupid me, stupid me. Why didn't I do it? And... Maybe the reality is what you said. Maybe it wasn't maybe, meant. Maybe, maybe it's not it about you. Meant for me. Maybe what my, like, for example, I have always been an educator. I love teaching. I have been teaching my entire life, so that's what I do. But when I wanted to slow down and, and teaching and do, do more like what you said, you know, like Vanity Fair and Vogue and all these fashion magazines, I, I'm still, I'm getting there, but it may never come. Mm-hmm. And I have to be I have to be okay with that, that some things are not meant to be all the time. You don't always get to decide your destiny. Sometimes part of your destiny is decided for you. It's decided maybe. during the journey. The journey. And the journey takes left and right turns and you go with the flow kind of thing. And this is the way the artist world is. Like sometimes it's know. not about you. Okay. Sometimes it's about the people you meet, the people that you Actually, just even a little bit of something that you did for them or with them has changed their life. Maybe it's a model that never really thought that she was ever pretty and then you took pictures of her and it changed her life. 
maybe it was, you know, you showing another photographer exactly what they need to do. And even though they surpassed you, you had something to do with that destiny. Sometimes it's just that itself. <laughs> I'm not even exaggerating, but I'm doing this podcast for the great people of the world. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I'm learning so much <laughs> myself right now. I'm like, I'm like really digging this and I'm digging it from a real honest organic point of view i i feel like sometimes we artists are very hard on ourselves i am and i am too and it's kind of part of our personality trait regardless of what your sign may be we seem to be very hard on ourselves we're highly opinionated we have we have this we have this feeling like we we should be given every artistic opportunity in the world and why did it, why were we not given that opportunity and is it you we always take it hard on ourselves we always think it's us mm -hmm. and and it's not you know and this is why it's so great to have you because you have a lot of experience in not only life but in the industry and you're bringing it to life for people to kind of take a chill pill about being hard on themselves and realizing that go with the flow go with the flow of the journey fuck it Exactly. Beep. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Beep. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. I have a button. I'm sorry. What did you say? Um. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, let's go on to the last few ones, and then we'll get into the actual program. But um, what is one thing you wish people knew about you that they don't? That's a good freaking question. What, what? Yeah. What would it be? Say that again. What is one thing you wish kind of people knew about you in general? Like, say you asked ChatGPT about Loretta Houston and it showed up. You're like, hey, they don't even hey, know. Hey, they're I gonna have, find out about that. <laughs> I have a very serious person. I'm a serious person when I need to be, especially when I'm working. But I am goofy as I don't know what, and I'm pretty chill. So outside of work, I'm a completely different person, completely different person. And only you would know if you would actually hang out with me. Which, by the way, may I say it's a real pleasure to do so? Yes. All the time. Yes. But you have not really got to know me, know me. We've hung out. You know, uh, you became a kind of an explorer of light two years ago. Mm -hmm. Three years ago. Three years already. Mm -hmm. What has that been like for you? Life-changing. Well, Life-changing. Um, darn it, that is... Mm. Life-changing is the best way I can say what being a canon explorer of light. Why, why is it life-changing for you? Like, what it has been for me, too. But I'm curious why you have everything, all your ducks in a row. You've been shooting for Tyra Banks, and you're shooting for, um, you know, Sports Illustrated, and you ABC, do all these big things. ABC, TV, all of it. Yet a, ca a camera brand, the, the, the best in the world, Canon, comes up to you and makes you a Canon Explorer of Light. And then you're saying it was life changing. That's a, that's a strong statement. Um, what made it so life changing? Because it changed me. Okay. I became a person that I never thought I would be. And I never thought that I would be an educator. I never thought that I would actually change people's lives. I even challenged myself. I would never be on a pack podcast or in front of a camera ever. I was always that photographer that said, you be the artist. You're the main attraction. I just want to actually create and make it happen for you. Now I'm in front of the camera and it makes a difference. I'm more confident. Um, I just, it's just such a great challenge. I've never, ever tried to, I don't know. It's just such a big challenge for me. And I felt like I've actually conquered it to a certain point. Just let the record show that I was there in your first teaching gig ever. Uh, and I think you did really well, but you were not comfortable in that environment. No, I was not. You were kind of like, this is your out of your. It was out of out my of norm. Your, out of your comfort zone. Yes. Because shooting and doing what you do and teaching others mm -hmm. that the process is two very different skill sets. Exactly. You know? So, yeah, no, I mean, I'm not going to 
to me, whether I be on stage or going to a campaign, whether I shot the client several times, I'm always nervous. The time that you get unnervous, that you're not nervous anymore, is a time that you need to evaluate your career. Mm. And you got into that very quickly because you came to teach at the Photo Creators Conference in Tucson, Arizona, two years ago. And thank you for having me. Oh, it was, <laughs> uh, it was such back to this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say, like, you are coming back because you have been one of the most requested instructors to come back and which is funny because you don't even consider yourself that much of an instructor because but now you are i and, heard and I now heard. and then people want you back you you really push the limits of fashion in the ranch and and i think people don't realize like photo creators conference allows has no limits in where you shoot exactly it's a 500 acre ranch in tucson where you can pretty much choose any place between lakes and 300 horses 15 ponies like everything you could possibly want, the, the desert landscape, the Sonoran Desert, you grabbed yourself a bunch of horses, you put the models on top of them, you made them lay down on the horses, you made them do all these things. I was just like, what is my liability insurance? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is my liability insurance? I didn't today? really think about that when I shot the models, yeah. but yeah. But what, what, what came out of that was uh, students were just effing mind-blown of what the how open your ideas were they they were limitless and and that was the first punch in the gut that Loretta Houston like brought to the conference is like don't be shy with your ideas don't be shy with your concept go after it you know go after it and and people were just like what's what is she doing what's all this stuff and the photos were just a lot of times students are a little bit reserved Mm -hmm. And you pulled that crap right out of them. You just sucked the reserveness out of them. And you said, go, we're doing this. I mean, as a photographer, when I first started, I started in the living room of my townhouse. I literally brought plaques, had some wood cut at Home Depot, made it the floor, had the background over it and started doing shoots in my living room. When you start trying to figure out what you can create within a small space, then that takes on to your going as you how can I say it is a part of you when you go to every shoot. So when I go to every shoot, I'm already evaluating before I even walk in the door. This is where I'm going to shoot. I'm going to go ahead and shoot on that horse because I've never shot with horses before. I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to do that because if it's there and it's free for you to actually create, why not take advantage of it? It makes no sense to me. You limit yourself when everything is there for you to explore. You limit yourself? Yes. When everything is there to explore? Yes. When you are holding yourself back from your creativity, you're not doing yourself a favor no. at all. Yeah, I agree. Okay. You as a photographer need to create and keep creating. And things that you never thought you would do, you once you shoot it, you're like, wow, I never thought I could do that. And that was some of the uh, some of the answers I got from the photographers who were at your conference. Can you imagine that concept you just said, how much it will open up people's creativity? I've been teaching for 20 years photography. And one thing I wish I could like get out of, out of any student of mine is don't question yourself. Don't be shy about your concept. And the, and, and the one thing I wish they would do more is get yourself in a room that you have limited options with limited equipment and create five variations of a really cool photo and keep at it until you get five really cool photos in that limited room with limited equipment. I agree. Your brain will be on fire and the struggle is real. And that is the only way you're going to expand your brain cells to become a much better photographer because when you open up your bag and you have 15 lenses and three cameras and you have the world is your oyster, you just get stuck. You just And we all have, like, know. even I'm almost 20 years in April, 20 years in photography, and I think I get stuck at least once or twice a year. Mm-hmm. And I was actually stuck before I went to your photo conference. Mm, you were. <laughs> I was stuck. In, and the thing is, people don't know that you're stuck. But it's to the point where 
you don't know what else to create because no one has challenged you or you've never been in a predicament where you would be challenged, right? So when you gave me that call and said, hey, Loretta, I want to invite you to my conference, I'm like, hell yeah. yeah. And when I went, it was, it opened up so much for me. I had so many creative ideas that I wanted to do and share with the students. And when I came back, I started making money again. When you're stuck and you get bored, it's just, that is a problem with me. I don't care how much money I make. If my creativity stops, I stop. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not in the environment to create, I need to make it creative. So even in my boring campaigns that I shoot, sometimes I got to make it creative because that's the only way that everybody's going to have a great experience. I am an experience. You said something funny, like the, the sometimes fashion photography, people think it's always exciting and fun, but a lot of times it's actually not. No, because we, we wear 10 hats. <laughs> you do, but it, I mean, a lot of times when I shoot campaigns, it's, you're actually quite limited. And that's, this is why I kind of still miss wedding photography, because in wedding photography, every step you take could be a different composition, a different room, a different place, a different vibe. But in fashion photography, consistency is important because you're why? trying to create a look, right? Like a story. To go with it. No, your so, brand. You are the brand. So why would you actually create? I mean more like editorials. You mm -hmm. have to be consistent on the on the background and it has to just change the outfit. And I find that not the most exciting thing. Fashion really? campaign. Yeah. I mean fashion campaigns are more could be more open because but you're still kind of like, we're gonna do it in the beach. We're gonna do it in this location. And you cannot stick to that. Editorials, you pretty much put a a white background or you, you have a background that's already set and you cannot keep that background and all that changes is the outfits basically and, and then that tells that creates the story you're looking at me like you don't agree yeah i don't agree okay why do you not <laughs> don't agree. i don't think it i don't think it limits you as a fast photographer you are the creative. You make everything freaking work, whether you shoot it. Like, I don't feel like if you shoot on white background, you got to shoot white background for the whole story. Take the model out. Take her on the street. It all will come together in the story. At the end, you'll create that story. So to me, I feel like there is no limit. What would you tell people listening about the difference between a portrait and fashion photography where fashion, the main subject is really the clothes, and portrait, it's really the face. But in fashion, especially these days, there has to be more of a, there has to be, and tell me if I'm wrong, and it could be, but they wanted to have more of a connection with the audience, like the model, the, the model has to have more like a human connection with the audience, but you're still assigned to make the clothing the hero. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? I think the clothing is not the hero you are. Oh my God. Dude, this is so good. <laughs> the clothing is secondary. You, the photographer, is the hero. You are the hero. I love that. You are the creator of that. You are the one that's going to create that, that scene, that story, when the clothes is there. Without you, it's not going to be seen. Mm. Period. I love that. I really do. Um this is a great conversation. By I'm way. not even joking. It is because I'm actually like, <laughs> because I, I feel like I'm not the hero. I feel like the, the, I'm always pushing to make the clothing the hero. But if you actually think about what you're saying, without it's, the photographer's creativity, how does the clothing come alive? The photography like, is like a meal. You are the meal. Everything else is secondary. A little pepper here, a little salt there, a little paprika there. Like, that's an addition to the main meal. You are the main meal. Hmm. Not the model, not the clothing. You are the main meal. This is just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, fun question for you. How do you choose models for a campaign? Is it their prettiness? Is it their attitude? Is it their bone structure? Is it how they move? Do you request a video of them moving? Is it their Instagram? All of it. How do you choose a model? What's the process? 
So the thing is, I'll look at a model's portfolio, but I can't base the model on a portfolio because it's based on photographer's perspective of the model and what they were shooting. For me, I choose the models based on what I'm shooting. So if I'm shooting fashion, I don't really go for pretty models. I go for the ones that you stare and try to figure out what their story is or who they are. Like you I really want people to connect to the model and not just because she has a pretty face. For me, I'll do a pretty face on maybe a lifestyle editorial or a portrait or a beauty or a lifestyle campaign or advertising. Those are great. But for a fashion editorial, I choose models that are not so pretty, but something that makes you think like the wide eyebrows or the wide eyes or the chiseled cheeks or maybe the the difference of their hair color or it might just be you know where they're not freckles I like imperfection and for me imperfection makes you think about the person because all of us are not we're not perfect and we would like something that we can actually relate to and so when I pick a model I want it to be relatable but also question you as a person because they're not perfect and neither are you. You like it, Lil? What are your thoughts? <laughs> Can I have a little bit? Can I have a little bit? Oh, okay. Here we go. All right. Here's a tough question for you. And I'm not even sure I was going to ask this, but you just, you just said something interesting that led me to thinking, should I ask this question? Mm -hmm. But it's a podcast and it's a real podcast. A yeah. podcast about reality of the industry. Right. So as a favor to the people listening and as a thank you to them, I'm curious. Uh, I, I'm thinking maybe I, go, I should go ahead and ask the question, but what do you, what are your thoughts, Loretta Houston's thoughts on this new trend on inclusivity with all body sizes? Like when you go to Target, for example, you see these uh, ads that with with uh, both men and women that are not by any means your traditional model body <laughs> that you can you think of, you know? Mm -hmm. And is that like, what message is like, is that a good, is that something that's amazing and that's good in the world to be able to finally break through? And I'm not talking about anorexic, an anorexic models that we, nobody ever wanted that. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm just like, there is models work really hard to keep their body in perfect shape mm -hmm. and they practice their posing and they practice how they move and they practice lighting. And, and now we have it like, it's been like a, like a trend that you start to see this body types that are not what you would consider model standard model bodies. Mm. And some of them go really far. Mm -hmm. Like the people that they're being, they're photographing are, um, are, not borderline, but completely obese. Mm -hmm. And I think to myself, everybody has a thought. What are your thoughts on that? Like, does that help people think I don't have to take care of my health because I can make it as a model anyway? Or does it say, actually, I'm glad to see that because no matter what my body looks like, I can still make it as a model. What are your thoughts about that? You know, the average woman is between size 14 and 16. I right? do. I do know that. Yep. And me, even as a, I call myself thick or curvy woman, what would I look like not trying to include other women? Now, I don't think it's our decisions or judgment to figure out what a woman needs to be with her own body, whether she decides to be a size 22 or size zero or two. But we also understand that fashion samples for clothing are between a zero to four. So the standard in fashion photography or fashion period has been a standard because the sample sizes of a model needs to be between zero and four. Now, as we've grown, uh, as we've grown over the years, <coughs> now we have including black models on runways. Now we're including plus size models in runways because what do I look like going to a store and not seeing who exactly who I am on a mannequin? 
for years we saw mannequins at very small, you know, size. But now I can go and I'm like, okay, she got a butt like me, you know, she thick. I can see my myself in that clothing. And it's not for everybody, but that's just that's that's exactly who we are as a society. We don't always have the same taste. And I think that's perfectly fine. I think it's a good thing to have more inclusivity. Um, it's hard to ask that question to people because it can get very sensitive. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was it's a little bit of a brave move to even bring that up in the podcast. But No, but it's, it's a must-needed topic. It's a good thing. Topic. And I wonder like, if you are a, a model body type, do you look at the ads with the people that are size 18, 20? Does that make you want to buy the clothes more? If you're a model size, or does that only relate? Does that only re, uh, relate to people that are see themselves more in that size group? I mean, if you really think about it, Victoria's Secret had models that were what five, ten, and up. We had, they had models between zero and four, maybe I don't know, but zero and four. It's only so much that's going to take, right? Then Rihanna came on the scene, and she decided to include other type of models right from short models to thick models to um, not so perfect models big breasts small breasts period just kept going that was the relatable part and that's exactly why she's successful because she relates to every woman that's walking on this earth and not every woman is going to be size 2 4 10 5 10 or up it's just it's not relatable anymore so that's why the content for fashion has actually changed, period. And so I think that's even better. Now we're actually including older women. Older women, we've never been on a fashion magazine that showcases us. Now, on top of just including curvy women, now we're including older women and they're just as beautiful. And these women need to be included too as well. And. That's why I feel the Pirelli calendar has switched a lot. Really? I haven't seen them in a minute. I mean, it's, it's been, it used to be like sexy shots of women. And, and now like, like the last shoot that Peter Lindbergh did for Pirelli, it was uh, the Pirelli calendar, which is probably the more coveted photo assignment in the world. Did you ever want to be a photographer for Pirelli? I would die to be a photographer. I, I wanted do, to be one too. I would do anything in my power to become a photographer that's assigned to shoot the calendar. I was like, the I want to be calendar. the first black female photographer to shoot Pirelli. Like, I really, that was on my, you know, again, yeah. my goal, right? Yeah. Um, but I ended up being the first black woman to shoot for Sports or Stay Swimsuit. So I feel like the same. You know, there's something. <laughs> you know, hey, mean, that's girlfriend. that's a big accomplishment. You know, let's do this. Yeah. To you. Let's do this. They started, um, they started, uh, Peter Lindbergh started shooting older actresses and, and people of all age groups. And I have his book for the Pirelli calendar here in the studio somewhere. And I love the photos. Mm-hmm. I love inclusivity. I just don't know how other people see it. I'm, I, of course, I love inclusivity. I mean, I'm a person that comes from a different country and pe- people have been nice, t- inclusive to me. And I appreciate that. And other people have not been inclusive to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I also appreciate that because it's made me stronger, thicker skin. I think you if know? you come to that point where it becomes a problem for you, you are more, um, you really want to actually have more inclusivity because you've actually had that same challenge. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we've experienced, just like you have experienced being discriminated against, I've experienced that myself a million times, more than I can count or care to count, mm-hmm. but it has never bothered me. Mm. It has always made me laugh really? of how little these people's brains can be. Mm-hmm. Like, how could you be so, how can you have such a small brain to just think that anyone that doesn't look like yours and is not born from the same country doesn't deserve the same common decency respect any human should, should should have. And I feel like anyone that thinks that they can disrespect any person that doesn't look like them, whoever they may be, I feel bad for them. 
At the end of the you day, know, it's, it's, it's a, I feel we bad. have the same color blood. See? Hold on a second, everybody. <laughs> We're running out of tequila. <laughs> Although some people think they have blue blood or something. Right. You, know? like, uh, but, you, you know? must be an alien then. I'll accept you too as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that, I think that was, that was really cool. I've never cared uh, to be discriminated against. I have seen it. I have felt it. I have uh, been told nasty things. And really? all, all I can think of is I is like how great my life has been because of my dedication to my work, mm -hmm. uh, my tenacity, the my go how much of a go getter I am. Mm -hmm. And I don't really understand why anybody has any you problems with anybody that. else. <laughs> you definitely are that. <laughs> you know, so it's like, why can people just you can learn so much from everybody who's not who's not like you. But imagine you, you know? as a photographer, you actually met so many people you would have not met if you were a photographer. I have been very blessed with different perspectives from different humans, from Romania to to Estonia to to even Russians, uh, Mexicans, Any Americans, lots of Filipinos. <laughs> my friend Arbeni, who's one of my best friends, is uh -huh. Filipino, and and I've I've talked to her. I um, I've had many Filipino friends. I just came back from the Philippines a few years ago, and and every experience that I have is just like, how much better am I going to be as a photographer as a result of these experiences? That guy know? said, I think photography, you as a photographer, I think it's all about the experience. If nothing else, whether you reach your goals or not, it's the experience that makes you who you are. You are the hero. You are the brand. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. meanwhile, while you're going through that journey, you meet other people that you have never, ever come close to instead of having six degrees to get to the person you want it now you're at one degree exactly you know what i'm saying exactly can we close with a fun question yeah i want to keep this podcast relatively short people can enjoy them and we'll move on with their day but i wanted to this is so good it kind of went over an additional 15 minutes but i do want to ask you you finally get your break and you get you get asked to shoot tyra banks or sports illustrated do you throw up like I already shot them though. Yeah, but the first time mm -hmm. when you were f doing the, your first shoot with Sports Illustrated, or when you the first time you were told that you're going to shoot, um, the, have have you shot Tyra Banks for Sports Illustrated, or that was a different? That that's was a cover, a, 2019 baby. Cover baby. <laughs> Let's see. Let me put this. The cover people. <laughs> cover right here. Right no. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um. When you go into these jobs, because people listening could get a break and shoot somebody who's not your average client, but somebody who carries more weight in their industry. Maybe it's a CEO, maybe it's mm -hmm. an actress, maybe it's a model, maybe it's something, someone of higher importance in their community. How do you handle the nerves of having a high profile client in front of your camera for the first time? Um, actually before I shot that or for any client really, but Tyra Banks, of course, um, this is a supermodel I watched for years on TV. Right. You know, I followed her and I was nervous for a whole week and a half, maybe two weeks. I only had two weeks to kind of get everything together before I flew out, but I didn't know how to shoot sports in the street. I didn't know how to shoot swimsuits. I've shot swimsuits, but not to the point of being a sports industry swimsuit photographer. And for me, yeah, I was nervous. The time that she actually put her foot on that sand was coming up to me. I was like, in my mind, I was like, actually, I didn't even in my mind, I actually said it out loud. I was like, Loretta, don't <laughs> fuck this up because it will ruin your career. <laughs> it will ruin your career. You better get it together because this is only you at one shot to do this. Right. And that was that. But the real impact was after it came out when I didn't really know if I was going to get the cover because magazines can change their mind, right? right? They can actually ask another photographer to shoot it, right? So for me, that morning when it came out at 6 in the morning, I think it was 5 or 6 o'clock around my time, but I literally woke up just to see if the cover would be mine. And when I saw it, I was in tears. Oh, God, dude, that makes me just get emotional. I man. cried for about a good 40 minutes because the texts came in. The phone calls came in. The emails came in and their whole site crashed. Loretta, give me this. 
<laughs> Come here. <laughs> Their whole site crashed because it's been a long time before Tyra came back to Sports Tourism Suit. And the fact that I made history, you know what I'm that's, saying? That's incredible. History, whether I die, when I die, I've left a legacy. Mm -hmm. I was that woman who shot that cover. Mm -hmm. And I cried for days, for days. And nobody really knew exactly that I was doing that. I changed the trajectory of my career. She helped me change that. She didn't have to choose me. She could have chosen another black photographer or any other photographer without the race, you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. the race card. But she took her platform to say that I'm going to put a woman on the map and she's going to be black and I'm going to help her. Not a lot of people will do that. Not a lot of people will actually say that's forefront when they actually make the decision to say, I want a Mexican photographer or a black photographer or an Asian photographer or whatever. You know what I'm saying? That secondary decision for her was the first. Why do you think she chose you? Why not? <laughs> like, why did you bring... Did you have a conversation? Did you do anything special? Did, was there something? All I know is that she had three photographers to choose from. And she actually put me in forefront. For, well, she had three photographers, right? But my creativity is what had her. She found me on Instagram. Not through referrals. Not for word of mouth. Nothing. She found me searching on Instagram, and she found my pictures. And from there, she actually created a Pinterest board with all my photos. No way. Yeah. Give it up, girlfriend. <laughs> Give it up. So I feel like as a photographer, I think 50% is your work. The other percentage comes with your personality, how hard you work, your creativity, and who you are as a person, period. But 50% is your creativity, That's going to get you at the door. But what's going to get you in the door is who you are, what your brand is, what you represent. That's going to get you in the door and that's going to get you the job. And Loretta, with that, <laughs> <laughs> what a killer ending. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. I, I think it's such a good cool thing that getting to the door is not the same as getting you in the door. Exactly. And then the other part is getting through the rotating door where you continue coming back. Exactly. You See, know? that's a great point too, that's because you one. want clients to call you back. And she did. That's right. She called me for her model's land that she opened in Santa Monica. She called me for the ABC job. She's called me several times for jobs. This is why and it's a small industry. You can't talk shit about people. No. You will get caught and the word will get around. And the minute you start tr trashing people in confidence in with other, like talking bad about somebody else in any way you perform, it's going to I think come that's back a character and, about yourself. It's going to come back and bite you. But it's a character you know? of yourself. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. When you start talking bad about other people, it doesn't look good on you. Yeah. It's not a good, it's not a good look. I say that because I sit down with, a lot of people do that. They, they do this. They talk stuff ab about other people. I don't appreciate I don't really want to hear anything about anybody else because everybody deserves respect. I'm not trying to be kumbaya here and rainbows and butterflies, but you don't know what people are going through. Exactly. And so why why say anything? Like they're not they're not El Chapo. They're just taking pictures. But of, you also have to understand like, that their that, journey you know? may not be as fast as yours. Right? Right. So you can't be mad that someone hasn't learned what you've learned at 20 years or 10 years or five years into photography. Right. They are at their own pace as you are too. And you can't compare yourself at that moment. No. All your, your own, your own challenge is you. That's right. And comparing. And not comparison to other people. Now there's a do. healthy, there's a healthy comparison, meaning I see this photographer who's doing this great work. Oh my gosh. I need to be doing something like that. And, but that is a healthy one when you challenge yourself, not envious of other photographers. See, you're, um, hit, you hit it right on the nail. Like I used to be, I used to myself, uh, I don't do that as much anymore, but I, I do remember me thinking, 
um, I'm going to compare myself to this person. How come they achieved this and I didn't? How come they got that and I didn't? And that has been a very toxic way of... It wasn't moving. your time. It wasn't my time. Um, you know, just people, relax. Your time is coming. Exactly. You know? So, But you can't sit around scratching your belly button, taking the lint out of your belly button all day. Exactly. Got to get your ass out. I don't even know what you just said. It was best to ignore. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is... You can't sit in your couch, bench watching something, taking the lint out of your belly button, thinking my time will come. One day my time will come. And you're just sitting in the couch. You got to get out there. You got to push. Marketing is the key. Getting out there. Go to trade shows. Get a booth. And get even if it's not there. getting yourself out there, it's creating something different that will catch other people's eyes. So, yeah, that time wasn't for you because you were doing something even greater. That's right. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So never, ever get upset that it's not yours because your time will come. You just don't know when and you don't have a tracking number for it. I'm straight, man. But when it does, that's when those tears come out. That's right. Do you know what I'm saying? That's right. 100%. Guys, we're going to close this. Um, Loretta, thank you so much for spending a little bit of your Sunday with me today. Um, I hope you can come back and do another crazy conversation. You know, Roberto, I just you thought know. like the first time I met you when I first came on Canon, right? Mm -hmm. As a Canon Explorer, like, I was like, this guy is going to be my friend. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know how I was going to do it, how it was going to, you know, come in fruition, but it did. And I'm actually grateful for you as a friend, yeah. as uh, someone that will just tell me the hardcore truth. I don't want nobody to just say yes to me, but I want somebody to challenge me like, Loretta, have you ever thought about this? Or you can't think that way anymore. Yeah. And thank you for being there. Thank you. No, you know, we've been, we've hit it off really well from the moment we met. Uh, I find you special because you are a person that just doesn't bullshit. You don't, you don't, you just say it how it is. And and that's that's a that's a skill and a quality in a person that I don't see often anymore. Mm -hmm. And I truly appreciate it. You can have your temperament, you can have your your pet peeves, you can have whatever. But what I love about you is how real and how you're not hiding things in your head and trying to keep little secrets to yourself and mm -hmm. and be like, oh, no, I'm not gonna say that because that's gonna give too much about what I do. And you're just like an open book for people. And I need more people like that. We all need more people like that in our lives. Because if I do something stupid, you will be the first person to tell me and, and say, like, what the hell are you thinking? And if you do something stupid, I am very happy to be, <laughs> you know, to be like, Loretta, what's happening here? And you need friends that are going to be real and have your best interest in mind. And that's hard to find. But I also want to say that even if you share your secrets, it's not going to hurt you. Nope. Because yourself is a brand already. That's right. Do you get what I'm saying? That's right. It's not going to hurt you. Yeah. What is the saying? Like, um, it's like when people copy you, the best they'll ever be is, is a terrible version of, your, of, of yourself. Hey, I've had that happen. <laughs> yeah, I've like, had it happen several yeah, times. It's like the best thing that's going to happen is that. And if it does, it's just like it is what so. it is. I've moved on from that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So <laughs> let that be their achievement, but yeah. I'm going forward to something else. That's right. Yeah. And guys, if you haven't heard um, one last few things, uh, you should try to go to the Photo Creators Conference. It's in May in Tucson. Uh, check out our, our lineup this year. And if you have any questions about it, leave it on the comments on YouTube. And um, Loretta was teaching there. She's definitely going to come back probably 2026. Uh, but check out the lineup. And I just finished my book called Picture Perfect Flash. And it's a book that I wrote to um, really help all the photographers out there not be afraid of flash, but not only not be afraid, but flourish, flourish with what a flash or a portable strobe can do for you. Uh, I don't think people should be limited to natural light. I think you should open up that book, read it, study it, take it chapter by chapter, and, and really practice what the book says. I wrote a book to be a workbook. It's not something that you read on a plane from Tucson to Phoenix, okay? You cannot be ready in a two-hour flight. But take a look. It's called Picture Perfect Flash. It was written with all my love for you to try to get you out there and succeed. And Loretta, do you have anything that you can... Did you have? Uh, I just have a model posing guide that I've actually developed and 
um, it is on my website under shop. And so, yeah, no, it's uh, not just model posing. It's also art direction. So I feel like you can't have one without the other. So check it out. It's important to have these resources available because they're, they come from people who have been there a lot for a long time and they're putting information out there that will take you years to be able to, to do or develop yourself. So check out her PDF. Check out Picture Perfect Flash. It's, written by, it's published by Rocky Nook. And definitely come to the Photo Creators Conference in May. This 2025 is May 5th through 8th. And we have a really incredible lineup. So check it out. Check it out. Loretta Houston, L-A-R-E-T-T-A, Houston, as in Houston, Texas, dot com. And with that, guys, thank you for watching this episode of the Curious Photographers podcast by Roberto Valenzuela. Cheers to all of you. Cheers. Cheers, Loretta, for the first one and definitely not the last. Yes. Take care, everyone. Bye. Hope you have a beautiful day. Take care. Bye-bye.